We have a crew. Could you three stand? We'll just put you right on the spot. We have Lindsay, Kate, and Tyler from Braveheart here with us. Um, so those of you who know Peter Lewis, they're also connected, and Lindsay's connected to Upper Room Dallas, but we're so honored to have you. You're, you're not just like part of a ministry we're connected to, you're friends, you're family, we're covenant. Uh, I know we've been running together for a few years now, so we're just so honored that you came here this morning. So thank you. Thanks for being here. We love you guys. We'll call them up at the end and just let us dismiss us however they want. All right, I've been in a series. I think there might be one other thing i got to cover as I'm not going by notes yet. Declare is next weekend. I think you may know one of the speakers. Um, Declare, some of you are like, what's Declare? Declare is uh, Caleb Ingram's ministry. He's, he's, he's a guy, a worship leader in our, in our region that has had this heart to connect the bride. To, to save the lost, but also connect the bride. So he does these worship events throughout our region just to connect local churches to worship together and hopefully reach the lost. So that's all that it is. It's, it's Sunday evening. It's on Troy Levy. It's where he did the very first one 10 years ago uh, in that spot. So I invite you to come out. It's just to worship, have fun. I know at 5 o'clock, like, there's food trucks and stuff, and the service starts at 6. So please be out there. It's a fun time. Last year was at the APAC. They kind of rotate where it is, and, um, but Troy's is at the Levy this year. Okay, let me see if there's anything else as my notes pull up. Maybe. We might just be doing something totally different today. Okay. Pinch the person next to you. Wake them up. Nick's like, absolutely. Okay. Um, Last thing, just a quick reminder. Mexico, like Angie mentioned, we're going to have a meeting afterwards. That's November 7th through 11th. Um, it's basically like a Thursday through Monday or Tuesday. We'll, we'll kind of get those exact dates once we check out flights of who's interested. Um, that's usually 700 or less dollars per person to go. We don't upcharge or pay for staff to go. Uh, we just go with you, and we just figure out what the Lord's going to do, and we do a ton of serving, ton of services, and, um, man, just encounter the Lord with our church in Mexico. Okay, into the series here. Last week, everybody say, woohoo! Woo! Finally, week six. I thought this was going to be like a three or four week series. It's turned out to be like eight weeks with six weeks focused on this um, because we just had to dwell on the heart, on, on the right posture to give because giving isn't a matter of money, it's a matter of heart. And uh, that's just where we've been in Luke 16. Um, just kind of recap here for a minute and then we'll get into this week. Uh, Jesus says, if we don't know how to handle unrighteous mammon, which is money, who will entrust true riches to us? So he's saying that the way that I steward money, the way we steward this, is what qualifies us for the real reason we're here, and it's a much greater purpose than money, okay? So, so there's this thing of stewardship and generosity that we've been pushing into, and uh, quite frankly, we just started with the heart. We talked about tithing. We went back to the heart because all of this is just a concept of faith, trusting the Lord, and what we trust the Lord with, he'll trust us with. Okay, so it's really just a condition of the heart. And um, so what I do with physical resources is connected to how I have access to the kingdom resources. So I tell my money where it goes. It doesn't dictate me. I control and dictate it. Okay, money's neutral. As we kind of just talk about some of this again. Money's neutral. In the right hands, it's great. It can feed the hungry. It can uh, grow churches. It can spread the gospel into nations, into unreached people groups. It, money's awesome. It, it can do great things. But then it can do really awful things. It can buy drugs, prostitution, all these things. But what matters is the heart behind the money. And we get to be not just ambassadors, but like generals to tell our money, like going into battle, where it's going to go. So we commission our money, and we sow intentionally where it's going to go. And um, so basically three overarching areas of stewardship. Oh, wait, I have notes for you. Can we pass out the notes? It's a glorious day in upper room when Aaron took time for notes. Let's get you those. How many, like, organized people and um, just planners are like, your heart's just, like, so full right now? Like, man, we have notes to go by. We have an outline. All right. Let's get back on this. As they pass those out, you're going to see some of that. But three overarching areas where we steward, where we give, and where we're generous. 
It's our, I'll, I'll give you a hint, three T's. Anybody remember them? Time, talent, treasure. So we talked about that, our time and our talent. Well, and then treasure, tithes, and then today we're finishing with offering and alms, okay? But then there's, we talked about four main ways to give, and it was tithe out of obedience, offering, um, and, and alms we'll talk today. Offering is sacrificial love. Alms is, we're motivated by mercy, and then yourselves. That's what we really focused in on last week, yourselves. In the last couple of weeks, we were talking about giving our hearts. So yourself in two areas, yourself to the Lord, your heart surrendered to the Lord, yourself in worship to the Lord. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Let this be your reasonable act of worship, giving yourself to the Lord, your first ministry unto the Lord, right? And then also serving and giving yourself in the way of service and serving others and serving the body of Christ. So these were kind of the four main ways to give. So what we're going to focus and just kind of lump this in together to get done with it, just to be honest, because I want to move into more fun things for me over the next few weeks, um, then to Thanksgiving, and we got Christmas and lots of fun stuff. Uh, so we're going to wrap this up today and honestly give you an investment opportunity. So, but let's, let's read Matthew 6, 21. It says, for where your treasure is, there is your heart will be also. Malachi 3, 8 through 12, just recapping tithe in the concept of tithing, but also it pulls in offerings. We'll often overlook the first part of some of this section of verse where it says, bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. So it says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions or offerings? You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord. How many, I, let me just say this, since we've been in this series, some of you have started testing the Lord in this, and I'm telling you, I'll share a couple stories later. The stories that we're hearing from you taking this leap of faith and tithing, it's been astounding. It's incredible the financial breakthroughs that we're getting back. Um, physical healings have happened. Uh, somebody gave their first tithe, they were physically healed of an ailment crazy things uh, benefits that have been withheld for so long are now getting granted decades later it, it's it's just incredible these stories of breakthrough so we're testing god in this we're seeing it it says if i will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need i will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear says the lord of hosts then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. We're going to get into some planting, sowing, watering, kind of in that language. So this is in that vein of what it is to, to commission our money into things. So we talked about like dining and dashing. Like you wouldn't eat in one restaurant and pay in another. Also, you wouldn't just eat and then not pay. Like it takes money for all of this. It takes stewardship. It takes generosity so that we can further God's kingdom and so that we can expand his kingdom and spread the gospel and the good news and lead people into encounters and transformations so tithe you bring into the storehouse out of obedience offering you sacrificially sow from love and alms you give from mercy so tithe belongs to the local church as well as offering does alms um, goes to the needy okay so you have tithes and offerings coming to the local church tithe um let me put it to you this way uh, i often call, talk about like the called could and should do Right, because we, we end up in a lot of should us, and as uh, one of our intercessors says, quit shooting on yourself, um, because we're doing things we should do and not what we're called to do. So there's things you're called to do, things you could do, things you should do. Okay, so if you put this in the context of tithes and offerings, we are called. Every one of us are called to tithe. It is a mandate from the Lord. It's biblical. It's scriptural. We've talked about it. We went into several weeks ago. If you missed it, just watch that sermon. Uh, we've talked about it. We're all called to tithe. We should give offering. That's like the next level down. We should do it. We should be giving an offering. We should be sowing seed into vision, sowing seed into purpose and intentional areas that are drawn from our sacrificial love in our heart that we're compelled to give to. And then we could be, we all could or, or sorry could and should i got those mixed up but we all should be giving to the needy if you see I, I learned this my grandpa as you know i'm third generation pastor my grandpa taught me that to never look past somebody in need and if i have excess it'd be a sin not to give somebody in need so my dad's lived that so we're the type of people hold, people holding up a sign at the stoplight i'm stopping i'm digging i'm looking for two three bucks five bucks here you go 
because it's not my place to judge. It's not my place to figure out what they're going to do with it. If they're going to use it for alcohol, maybe so. Either way, they're hurting, and they need the kindness of God to reach their heart. Okay? I just pray for them. I, God bless you. I try to give them a quick word of encouragement, pray for them, and do my part. Let me tell you a very, very brief version of this story. My grandpa uh, was driving from uh, Troy to Piqua on 25A. Um, and, and a guy was hitchhiking. He's always a guy uh, that would pick up hitchhikers, as I am, as long as my kids aren't in the car. I pick up every hitchhiker I can. I want to hear their story. I want to pray for them. Don't want to get stabbed, but I want to reveal the goodness of God. <laughs> so I'm that guy. So anyway, uh, my grandpa picks up this guy a few miles down the road between Troy and Piqua. Um, my, my grandpa said, how are you, sir? Where can I take you? He's like, oh, just up the road. And uh, he's like, okay, what's your name? Guy wouldn't talk much. And all of a sudden, he's like, this is good. And goes to get out of the car. He's like, thank you, Dorsey. My grandpa never gave him his name. All of a sudden, looks around, guy's gone, okay? Some decades later, maybe 20-ish, I don't know the exact time, but some extended period later, uh, my grandpa, my grandma loved to shop. She was very eccentric, uh, loved Beals Outlet, Okay, any other takers and Beals Outlet like in the Florida area? So they're down in Florida. My grandma's shopping, and my grandpa's taking his um, very duty-like husband role on the bench outside. Anybody else do that? I do that. I try to get a cup of coffee or something. I'll just sit and wait for the girls. I have five girls I live with, so I find myself on many benches outside of stores <laughs> on vacation. So my grandpa's there, all of a sudden, the same man that he picked up in between Troy and Piqua sits down on the bench, unaged, 20-some years later, and says, how you been, Dorsey? So there's a scripture that says you never know when you're entertaining angels. So when we give alms and we give to the needy, sometimes it's those we may never see again. Sometimes we're giving maybe to angels. I don't know. Either way, I don't take a chance because it says I know, you never know when you're hosting or entertaining angels. So tithe is a 10% and it's activated by obedience. Offering is activated by faith through vision and alms is activated by mercy. Tithe is obedience that brings the increase to sow into a vision for the mercy to fall. Let me, let me just kind of move through this. Are we good with that? Alms. So alms is, is when mercy tugs on our heart. We see somebody in need. We know there's somebody in need. We, we know there's somebody that needs groceries. We know that there's somebody begging for money or, or whatever. And it's this realm to where our, something is tugged on our heart in mercy to help somebody else who is in need or to care for somebody in need. So as a church, we do this. Uh, Christy lost, lost her husband, uh, young age. Drew and Christy were driving away from here on a November uh, a few years ago. And all of a sudden, they, he rear-ended the back of a semi. He lost his life, and Christy was injured, broke her neck. We cared for Christy and Emmaus, uh, and then also cared for her as a widow, because the Bible says, take care of the widows of the church. We've mowed Lola's church. I mowed Lola's, I'm sorry, Lola's church. I mowed Lola's lawn when I had a lawn company. The entire duration I had a lawn company, because the Bible says, take care of widows. We, I believe, paid Christy's rent for like two years or something uh, as a widow, um, after Drew passed away. And this is a woman, man, Christy, you're amazing. You are so amazing. Uh, she's lost, how old are you, Christy? 34, and she's lost two husbands to tragic deaths and has two kids, um, a kid from each of those husbands. And here she is standing, worshiping, praising God, walking in joy, walking in peace, walking in hope. Um, I don't know how you do it, but you're amazing. I don't say any of that to brag on, on us as a church, but I say that, that when we saw somebody in need and we know the Bible says so, we took care of her because of the love we have for her, and the Bible says so. And let me just tell you, Christy, you are good soil that we have sown in, and we love you so much. Um, man, it was fun playing. She said we were a huge part of that being the trajectory, keeping her um, going towards Jesus in her life. Um, when, uh, this is the fruit of, of just doing what the Bible says. And uh, so she drives by our house and her, her little girl, uh, she, she drives by and, and referencing to Nicole, how, how old is Izzy? Five. She's like, when am I going to play with my friend? <laughs> 
<laughs> so Nicole has Izzy over like uh, every couple months and they, they, they pull carrots out of the garden or go play with the chickens or chase after the cats or whatever. But she's like, when am I going to play with my friend? And Chrissy's like, what, your friend? Miss Nicole, my friend, come on. So anyway, those are acts of alms when you're taking care and caring those who are in need. And, and it's just part of our, listen, we've been through this series talking about we're generous because Jesus is generous. We give because he gave all of himself. So now this is, it's not just something we do, it's who we are. It's the fabric of our DNA. Christians are generous. So alms, though, serve as a trigger for the supernatural to flow. Let let me bring you through some things. Acts 10, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read. I was going to read the full chapter. Uh, Let me trim off some. So Acts 10, um, I want to just talk to you and then a few other references about how alms trigger it is a trigger it's a catalyst for the supernatural to flow in miracle signs wonders and and the holy spirit to manifest and blessing to be poured out in this way of supernatural lifestyle because let me just tell you this when you're generous god is generous and when you submit and you start giving in generous ways he starts pouring out in generous ways so you have in this chapter and it's, it's referenced in your notes so please read this but you have cornelius and, and all of a sudden, Cornelius is there, uh, angel shows up, and, and here's what, what he said. He says, um, let me just go back to verse, let's just, I'm just going to spot around here. Verse 2, he was a devout, speaking of Cornelius, he was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. This is a man leading his home that not just he, but his household are people after God's heart is what I'm interpreting here because it was his whole household that gave generously to the poor and prayed often. Okay, so then uh, angel shows up. uh, It says your prayers um, in verse four, I think. Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by who? God. Not just the poor. When you're giving to the poor, you're sowing into the seed of a child of God, of a circumstance, of soil that's actually the Lord. So you're actually giving it unto, and as you, we talked about last week, you're doing unto the Lord. It says, have been received by God as an offering. So our alms to those in need is an offering to the Lord. So you get through this, and then um, it says, go to Peter. He sends messengers to Peter. Peter's awakened by this dream of basically all these weird animals that he wasn't supposed to eat, and he's eating, like all this stuff, right? Because it's giving this reference in chapter 10 here that it's talking about the difference of Jews and Gentiles, but God works through all of them. No matter the differences, no matter the variety. So then we get to this place where Cornelius comes to Peter's house. I'm sorry, where Peter comes to Cornelius' house. I may have had a little too much coffee today, and I'm all amped up, excited to get through this. Cornelius um, then shares with Peter why, and there's all these confirmation leads him there. So Peter then, here's what happens. As you get to the middle of the chapter here, starting in verse 34, for the sake of time, he basically shares the gospel, and it says that Cornelius had invited friends, family, they were all at this house. And, and now Peter just shares the gospel. He shares about sin. He shares about Jesus, how he conquered it. He, he gets, shares the simple gospel and the truth of who Jesus was. Now, let's go to verse 44. It says this. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out onto the Gentiles too. <laughs> Again, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Republicans and Democrats. I mean, kidding for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising god then peter asked can anyone object to their being baptized now they have received the holy spirit just as we did on the day of pentecost the same thing swept through now now let's go back why did they get to this point how through cornelius's generosity and giving to the poor and prayer Now, all of a sudden, Peter comes, shares the gospel. They all get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and now it says that they get baptized in water. So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Revival broke out. Listen, alms and even offering is a catalyst for the Holy Spirit and the supernatural and other things to take place. So if you look throughout the Bible, Stephen's another example. Stephen, who was the first martyr in the New Testament, was in charge of taking care of widows, and he would give them uh, bread and alms. 
God began to work, many, it says, many wonders through his hands. Now, here's the crazy thing. There were so many signs, wonders, miracles, healings breaking out that it actually got the attention of Saul and he wanted him to be stoned because of such works and following Jesus. I'm okay with that. I'm okay that to be accused of, of, of being so close to Jesus and so much supernatural going on that I challenge the religious spirit through generosity launching and being the catalyst of that. You have Peter uh, going into the temple and, and you have a, 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 a lame man sitting there begging for alms. And it says, Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but, but let me tell you what I do have shares the gospel she tells him about Jesus all of a sudden this man gets up walks away and that became the catalyst of, of, of a breakout in that land of spirit of salvations of healings of the supernatural of signs wonders and miracles again alms being that catalyst and if you think about the Acts church as you go from Acts 2 to Acts 4 it talks about how they basically came together sold everything they had and then they cared for one another and they lived with joy with praise signs wonders miracles but gener extreme generosity and yet then it said miracles signs and wonders followed them and thousands were added to them so as we're seeing this uh, alms and even offering but alms specifically right now is this catalyst to bring in the supernatural and unleash the Lord in these situations. Um, let me talk about offering now. Offering is the sacrificial love gift. It's, it's sowing into vision or purpose that you're drawn to, okay? It's above tithe. Um, let me just kind of get here. Tithe is, uh, on, on the tithe series, on the tithe message I did, tithing is basically budgeting 101, okay? It is the, the base principle. It is the first fruits. It's the thing you set aside first. Then it goes offerings and alms. So, so it's this thing to where, let me just, what I said that week, first off, if he doesn't have your heart, start there. <laughs> Don't care about money. Give him your heart. Once he transforms your heart, he'll transform your generosity. Then you start with tithing. If you're not tithing, I don't want you to sow into a capital campaign or anything else today. Just start by tithing, okay? And that's why we did this series. We, and I'll get into that and the why and the when and how that. Uh, we had planned, uh, I'm just going to get into it now. We had planned to do a capital campaign two years ago. And just a series of things happened, didn't do it. Then we're like, okay, well, it's just, we, we, we got an interest rate on the loan at 3.75%, amortized 20 years. We're like, can't pass that up. So we didn't need a capital campaign to start it. And we had a few hundred thousand in the bank, put it down, went for it. So, so here's kind of where we're at is, um, then we were like, well, we should still do a capital campaign because we still don't want debt. But then we had this, I had this conviction and I repented on the first week of this that I hadn't talked on tithes in 16 years. And how can we ask people for, um, to sow into a building if they're not sowing into the Lord? So it came out of conviction, sorry. It honestly came out of conviction that um, I had to repent that I have robbed you of blessing of the windows and the, the doors and the floodgates of heaven being poured out on you because here we were going to ask for a building campaign when I haven't even thoroughly spoke on the number one or two things that Jesus spoke about in the Bible. So here we are. So let me just uh, get back to offering. So offering the Bible, Moses brought an offering to the Lord in the wilderness. David brought an offering to the Lord in the tabernacle. Uh, the people brought offering to the Lord in the temple. A woman at Jesus' feet Man, I can't wait. I have a message prepared. It's how I was actually going to close service last week. The woman with the alabaster jar. Don't think I'll get there today, but it is banked, and I can't wait uh, to go after that. But women throughout uh, Jesus' ministry actually worked and funded his ministry. Paul continuously thanked uh, the, the churches that he's writing letters to for their support and generosity in supporting his ministry. So it's not just ties that are mentioned throughout Scripture. Offering connects people to God's vision and providing for advancing his kingdom. Moses, when he was building the temple, uh, Moses, he... he, he, he <laughs> cast such vision and the lord was on this so so heavy that people gave so much he's like whoa whoa whoa! that's enough we have more than enough to build the temple how many believe i have that faith for us here like there's more than a stop giving give more offering and alms go give alms we don't need it here I, man 
But I want to bring you to, I'm um, not going to read the scripture, it's 2 Chronicles 29 through 31, talk about uh, King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, so, so once again, Israelites had drifted away from the practices of the temple, uh, from their offerings, their sacrifices, the things that Moses had laid out. And King Hezekiah brings it back. He reinitiates um, the practices and the generosity and the giving and the offerings for the temple. And as a result of that, the priests and Levites begin to consecrate themselves again, which means now worship started again. Set aside priestly duties and worship and praise and prayer started again. The people brought abundant offerings. They celebrated the Passover for the first time in many, many years. And the nation turned back to God and spiritual revival and joy broke out throughout Judah. These are the things when we, when we do, as the Lord says, all of a sudden there's revival. There's these things. There's life that happens. So I want to talk about just vision a little bit. So tithe is budgeted, it's planned, it's set aside, it's the starting point, right? But offering is motivated by love, but sown into a vision by faith. I'm just going to say that again because it's super wordy. Offering is motivated by love, and it's sown into vision by faith. So we sow our offering into where there's vision or purpose or something that, yeah, hey, that feels good. We should, we should sow into that. We want to we wanna be a part of that. We want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We want to go bigger, and it's sacrificial love through faith. So God will never give a vision if he doesn't have the plan of provision to fulfill it. Let me just say that even in your life, if God's telling you to start a ministry or doing, he's, your part's just step, if it's God and if he's giving you that vision for whatever it is, launching that business, whatever that creative thing is or, or whatever it might be, he, if you step out of the boat, he's going to give the provision to make it happen. That's what happened here and that's where we're at. So honestly, by faith, we're just receiving that the Lord's going to just make it happen. And I'll, I'll share some of that here in just a moment. So when vision is released, people give and sow to connect their purpose into something bigger than ourselves. Uh, Russell Johnson, I was one of the references I gave in our first uh, week of this, or second week, I had another thing in notes with a bunch of references of uh, Michael Miller's message on stewardship and generosity, Russell Johnson, some others. Anyway, I like how he kind of connected this to sowing and seed, and, and he says, tithe is how I buy the land. Offering is the seed that I sow into the land, and alm is the water that waters the seed that I planted in the land that I bought with my tithe. So hang with me for a second. So we sow, okay? Uh, Paul and Apollos, like, I sow, you water, but who brings the increase? God. So we sow, we water, but God brings the increase. So when we do our part, he does his part. His promises are what? Yes. yes and amen. So sometimes we think, well, it's just going to happen. Well, sometimes he's actually asking for your process. So it's his promise, his, his yes, it's his promise of yes, it's our process of amen. If you get a prophetic word, sometimes that's a seed to actually be a catalyst for you to do something. Somebody gets a prophetic word. You're supposed to minister in the streets of Dayton. I see you on the Oregon District streets sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus. Okay, you actually have to get in your car. You have to drive down to the Oregon District and hit those streets, as the prophetic word says, and do your part, and then the Lord will take over. Can I get an amen? amen. It's his promise, and he's going to be the provision, the grace. The, he's going to make it all happen, the empowerment. Like, he's got you. But sometimes you need to do your part. And it's the same thing. Like, he wants to bring the increase, but sometimes we've got to do our part. Paul uh, says it this way in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. It says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his what? Heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves an angry giver. <laughs> Cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that have all sufficiency in all things at all times. You may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be what? 
generous. Are we tracking? Oh, there's no scriptures. I just assumed you were reading along with me. Not going to lie. So those of you who are filling in blanks, God bless you. You know your word. Those of you who don't, get in your word. <laughs> All right. Now I even lost where I was. Okay. You will, verse 11. Okay. In the back, I'm in 2 Corinthians 9, now reading 11. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and all for others. By the gospel of Christ and your generosity. Previously, by... Cornelius, by being generous and by prayer, by what Jesus did and by what you're doing, trusting Jesus. 14, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Okay, so God trusts us with what we trust him with. Okay, we've said it like this the last few weeks, do good with little, much is given. So, so sometimes it's this test, right? And, and when we do good with little, much is given. So you cannot receive a blessing with a closed fist as much as you can't receive his heart with a closed heart. You also can't give a blessing with a closed fist or give your heart with a closed heart, right? It's, it's this thing that I freely receive, freely I can give. And whatever I sow multiplies, but if I don't sow, it not only withers, but it doesn't even have a chance to grow. If I don't sow my time, if I don't sow my serving, if I don't sow my treasures, it doesn't even have a chance to multiply and produce fruit. If I don't sow it, it doesn't have a chance to grow and produce any fruit. Um, two, two examples. When Hannah gives Samuel, we referenced that last week, when, when Hannah gave Samuel to be um, given to the temple for the work of priestly duties and to Eli and, and to the Lord, all of a sudden he opened up her womb. When Abraham gave Isaac, he became a father of many nations. So um, 2 Corinthians 8, we're going to end there. Uh, Matt, you can come up to the piano. Uh, you might be here a minute, though. You can choose to come now or like three minutes. <laughs> Let me just tell you what I did. I saw my notes where I'm closing, but I realized my closings are sometimes two and three long. Your choice, bro. But this is my first closing. All right, 2 Corinthians 8. I know we've re referenced this a few times, but um, man, I feel led to, to read this again. I'm really going to dwell on that first part. Uh, let's read 2 Corinthians 8. Let's do 1 through roughly 7. Okay? Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested in many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy which has overflowed in rich generosity. Here, a famine has broken out. It's a persecuted church. Uh, they're impoverished people, and they're going through the ringer right now. They're in trouble. They're in need. But yet, here they're flowing and overflowed with abundant joy and rich generosity. So Paul says, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing and the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. This is a church that is being persecuted. They're impoverished, and they're begging to give more. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to. We referenced that last week. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish the ministry of what? Yes, giving. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious 
ministry or act of what? Giving. This grace of generosity, this grace of giving, this, this ministry of giving. So, so Paul's raising funds for a famine that broke out and uh, for the persecuted church from the persecuted church. And he said, hey, look what all they've done. Now I'm asking you to sow into it. And I don't think it was as much about the amount as it was the heart and the need to give of yourself of everything you can. Nicole referenced, I think it was Mark 12, but when Jesus is watching the plate uh, as, as they gave, right? He's at the front of the church, we can picture. There's a basket here, and Jesus is watching, and, and, and we see that these rich guys, are, they're giving all this money and this cash. I, I think I picture them like rolling out deep, right? Toting big bags, as my nephew's lyric would say in one of his rap songs. But then there's this, this woman who didn't have anything, who gave just a couple coins, but she gave it all. And how Jesus was touched by that. Now, so, so you know the best time to pour out is when we don't have anything. You know the best time to praise is when we're going through the mess. The best time to give is actually when we have very little faith for it, and then we just see what the Lord does with it and multiplies it. See, see who funds it is equally persecuted and impoverished, giving to an impoverished, persecuted church. I, um, I watched a series a couple uh, years ago, a few years ago, called Kindness Diaries. Um, it's like this adventure guy, and I think it was on Netflix or something. It's definitely worth looking up. First season was better than the second. Uh, he's going around on this little motorcycle with like a little sidecar, and he has zero money, and he's getting around the world only on people's kindness. And he can only receive gifts in the way of gas, uh, travel, and food. And like staying somewhere in somebody's house for the night to stay warm and things like that. Travels around the world, does it. Com Sorry if I ruined the documentary for you, but he completes the task. But here's the deal. You know who gave the most? Were those who had the least. There's this one episode where he's actually in the streets and he's with homeless people. And you know they were the most generous on his whole journey. And then these Christians with a story who had very little... Like, those who gave the most had the least. I think it's because we don't forget where we came from. We don't forget who saved us. We don't forget our story. So when somebody else is in need, we can relate to that because we're not distant from that. So sometimes it's when we're in the mess that we give the most. Sometimes it's when I don't have any time at all and somebody calls me like, I need help. I'm like, hey, what you need? Ask somebody to help you move. You'll figure who your friends are giving in trial my lack is waiting for God's overflow your lack your circumstance is waiting for God's overflow giving is a privilege not an obligation see they pleaded with Paul can we give more we want to keep the gospel going Jesus is real his signs and wonders are real his gospel is real his his body was real his blood was real and it paid a price and eternity is real so can we give more we don't have much, but what we have, we're going to give. And God gives the grace on this ministry of generosity. Today, we're actually inviting you, and I don't, I don't mean any of that in guilt. Again, if you've not given your heart to Jesus, that's your starting point. Next step is tithe. Um, we're not in a financial position where we can't afford the mortgage that we took out on. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done it. We as a board voted, you as a church voted to build what's, what's here now. Um, based on what we had, on zero expectation of any capital campaign. Didn't need it. But we want it. <laughs> here's, here's what's happening. And let me just be real with you. Um, in today's culture, there's a famine breaking out. And there's a Generation Z and an alpha generation who needs Jesus. And we heard that there was going to be a harvest of Gen Z and alpha and those to come. And we knew they were going to need a home to come into. Of moms and dads, of brothers and sisters who were going to love them, brush the dust off of them, love them where they're at, and lead them to the most precious Savior ever to exist, Jesus. That's what we heard. We knew that. We said, okay, one, we don't want to go back to two services and it's standing room only. 
two, we know there's a harvest coming and they need a, a place to call home and they need a place to be loved. They need a place to have a seat at the table. They need a place to belong and they need a place to be discipled. That's what we heard. Say, okay. And we heard if you build it, they'll come. So we're building for the next generation. We've called it the legacy expansion. And um, let me just say this. If, if you love worship and you love preaching but hate giving, or let me word it to you this way, the church just wants my money, then what you're saying is... I'm a taker, not a giver. Our top priority isn't a huge capital campaign or a building to pay, be paid off. It's, it's for the Lord to capture your heart on this and Him to capture yours. For you to capture the Lord's heart and Him to capture yours. Let me just, um, just share where I'm at. Again, I don't feel we need a dollar. But we have a loan, and we want to get it paid off. And I, my heart before I um, am done pastoring would be to hand the church over um, debt-free. I, I, I don't want the next generation to have any debt. I want them to be able to give freely. Those of you who don't know, 10% of our total income always goes out to other missions and missionaries and uh, ministries. Um, so we tithe ourselves. So when you give, you're actually tithing and to tithe <laughs> as a body. It's fun. So, but the legacy, I think sometimes, like I said, offering is, is sown into vision. It's sown into purpose. And I just, I'd be robbing you of an opportunity if I just, if we just took the loan out and we just pay and let the givers just continue to give and, and do this. But we'd be robbing you of an opportunity if we didn't let you sow into the next generation and this legacy expansion. So it's totally up to you. It's private. Um, we're going to pass out some cards right now. And um, just leave the card. If it's zero, fine. If it's a dollar a month, fine. But I know there's people sitting here that can make a serious dent in this. And um, man, just whatever your heart leads you to, we are going to ask to see if you want to sew into uh, paying off that building. Um, we have goals. But I feel like the Lord is going to actually just like destroy that goal and give way more. But let me just, we're going to show up a slide here of just the legacy expansion of the building and kind of what's happened throughout the process. Um, we're way more advanced in that now. Um, but I want to just cast vision of what it is. Now, this is an offering portion of what the series is. Okay? We didn't do the series to get to this. Let me just say that. There was no manipulation here. Um, again, we, we, don't, we don't need it. We will do what the Lord's called us to do. We're still going to give our 10% to missions. Uh, we're still going to host his presence here. We're still going to be a dwelling place, a house of prayer. We're still going to be launching morning, noon, and night prayer. Okay? Uh, that stuff's going to happen. We've been good stewards. We, uh, we have enough operating expenses in our bank to, to go at least six months without a single dollar coming in. Like, we're good stewards. There's no full-time staff here. It makes it kind of easy. We have no full-time staff, so a little overhead. But this was this became an idea. My wife had a word. Can I just share the story with you? Is that cool? And then, then we'll close with Braveheart. Um, we'll take up the offering and kind of let them close the service out. But my wife had a word during COVID when we were packed in basically two services. Um, those of you who remember that, we did it for over four years. We had two services, nine and 11. And um, Nicole had a word. She's like, I think we're supposed to go to one. Like COVID was basically done. And I was like, how are we going to do that? She's like, I don't know. I just, I think we're done. The, the servants are getting worn out. The worship team's getting worn out. It feels like we have two churches. Um, <laughs> thank God for a wife that hears Holy Spirit. So we did. We we're just like, all right, one service. And we're like, we think we've made church kind of easy. So it became like fight to get into the parking lot. People are coming in here. Uh, I've seen this thing on Instagram this week, how people save seats in the church. Have you guys seen that one rolling through? There's like Cheetos spread out and shoes and Bibles. It kind of became that uh, until a few weeks ago when we expanded this. But anyway, um, we're like, it just became easy. But once now that we've been doing this a couple years in one service, I don't ever want to go back to two. I don't care how full we get. I don't care if there's a line. I don't care if... Uh, so we dropped $2.3 million 
um, to blow this wall out essentially so that we don't have to go back to two services and be two churches. So that's kind of the gist of it. But then as we're doing this, we're trying to figure out better financial ways to do it. And uh, we're like, well, if we're doing that, we're breaking ground. We don't have a youth space. The youth have never had their own room. The youth come into a huge sanctuary to do like small group and do fun stuff. And um, and Corey's like, come on, preach. Um, So then we started like, okay, what's it look like to do this? And it's not, once you're doing it, it's not more to do more. It's not much more to do more. So it blew out into uh, having a space for community. Um, As how many saw the LifeWise bus when you pulled in here? Man. Hundreds of kids were in here Tuesday hearing the gospel and the goodness of Jesus. And we charge them nothing. Like, uh, life-wise, just to come in here. There's some churches that charge and we're allowed to. They can pay rent and all that. We're like, no, we want the next generation to hear the good news and to know Jesus. So we're like, okay, let's build rooms for them. Let's expand. Kids' ministries was packed on Sundays. We have this opportunity in LifeWise. We're like, all right, let's build that. All right, well, a gym would be fun. Let's make sure we have a gym for the youth and LifeWise. And, and let's have the senior citizens here for pickleball. Let's do all of this stuff. So it became what it is now. And because um, we saw this space and all of that gets blown out and connected here in the next few weeks. And there'll be a cafe so that you're not rushed out of here or rushed in here. And you'll have this space to just hang out and do life and have fellowship and communion with one another at a table. Um, woo. We built here um, when my parents were looking for land and we prayed and us in leadership and the, the body then we prayed and we're like, this is it. We were nestled between the two um, big schools of Tip City. And we knew that this was a hub, going to be a hub to be a light for him to the next generation. So now I'm even um, offering our building and our gym to the exploding FCA group that's meeting on like Wednesday mornings at Tip High School. So well, I'm like, I'm, I mentored the young guy leading that who was part of FCA back then. And I was like, Patrick, you need anything. Our doors are open. We have a gymnasium that's about to open. We have a gym. It's, an, it's a fellowship of Christian athletes. It's blowing up in Tip City. They've had to move rooms already because their first week they launched this a couple weeks ago had 60 kids show up in a classroom in the morning to hear about Jesus and to connect and get into the Bible. So... Anyway, these are things that we're excited about. What we're doing is for the next generation. There's a dedicated prayer room. There's more discipleship and small group rooms and teaching rooms. There's a counseling room, a sozo room on the first floor so that way we're not having limited of people who can't walk upstairs, all this stuff. So that's, that's what we're doing. It's, it's honestly, we called it legacy because it's for the next generation. Um, we're sewing into that. So that's what we're doing. Kurt and I have led this project um, tirelessly. Woo. And, um, but our heart and what keeps me motivated is being able to hand this over to the next generation when that time comes. Um, so we're going to take up tithes and offering, okay? Uh, I, I just asking you to fill out that card. On the back here, you can um, do it later, further. But the card you have right now, if you could turn that in today. Um, again, I know there's some that can do the 1000 a month. I know there's some that can do way more than that. Um, but I also know there's some sitting in this room like a like dollar a day is a stretch. Like, it's fine. Just, I believe the Lord will bless it and multiply that dollar as much as he will the thousand, as much as he will the hundred thousand. And um, let, me, let me just say one more thing. Uh, one time I sent a gift to, to Leif Hetland and, and Jennifer or our church or us personally, I can't remember. And, uh, and I, I, I apologize. I said, sorry, it couldn't be more. And Jennifer called me. I think I texted her that. She called me and she's like, boy, don't you ever apologize for the gift you give. She's like, you know, we pray and we thank the Lord over every penny that comes into our ministry. And she said, your sacrificial gift is is as important and is as big as the big gifts we receive. So she's like, Aaron boy, sometimes she'll call me that. She's like, don't you ever think of that like that again. So that's what I'm saying to you. not begging here. I'm just saying this is an opportunity to sow. So sow where the Lord leads your heart. And um, man, just fill that out by faith. Uh, This is activated by faith. So uh, that's all we're going to do about that. So uh, ushers, are you ready? Okay, tithes and offerings now. Um, And you can text Upper Room Ohio if you need to give tithes or regular offerings. Um, 
right now to upper room, text Upper Room Ohio to 77977. So we're going to end with tithes and offering. And I want to challenge you um, just to be overwhelmingly generous in every area of your life, not just this. I, this is going to come and go. Okay. Um, this is important. It's great. We're sowing into a building that is a tool to spread the gospel and expand his kingdom. But let me just tell you that what? That's not the most important thing here. What's important is that his presence dwells and we are around the center of Jesus and his people gather here. Okay, this is a tool. It's, that's all, all it is. It's a vessel to house what really matters, him and his people. And that's what's precious. So let me pray over the offering. Uh, let's pray that it'll be multiplied. Let's pray that it'll be radically, um, man, just, just crazy, crazy, crazy multiplied. Not just for upper room, but whatever you give is multiplied uh, to you as well. So Lord, we thank you for the tithes. We thank you for the offering. We thank you for uh, the heart to give and to be generous. We thank you for your heart. We thank you for um, just transplanting your heart in us right now to be generous with our time, our talents, our treasure. So God, I pray that this offering, especially uh, the campaign offering today, is just multiplied and that you remove any pressure of any debt and uh, Lord, that it's, it's all your will, that it's yours. We submit this to you. We surrender to you and ultimately we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just so you know, uh, we might reference this a couple times. That's the big ask. It's not going to get worse than that. Um, we unfortunately haven't talked on this for 16 years, so probably going to do it more often than six, every 16 years, um, but that's on me. Um, okay, we're going to ask the Braveheart crew to come up and uh, get them a microphone. Do you guys remember a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, um, I referenced Lindsay who um, said she had to die to herself. I talked about cheer and how she had to die to that. Anybody remember that? The few of you that were paying attention that week. This is Lindsay. This is who died. Welcome back to life. You guys go. Hey guys. Okay, so this is so interesting. I felt like I got a word for you guys at the beginning of the message. I had no idea that this entire project was called the Legacy Project. I didn't know it was all about the next generation. All of this stuff, I feel like I have a word for the young people in the room. So if you're 25 years and younger, can you raise your hand real quick? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, there's two things. Um, and they're two sides of the same coin, I believe. And they, it's, it's almost like a wineskin that he's building. And the thread of the wineskin is the oil of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to explain. Um, there is more for you in the secret place. There's more for you in the secret place. Little ears, open up. Hear the sound of my voice. There's more for you in the secret place. Um, and on the other side of that coin... There is some repentance, I believe, just from friendship with the world. And this is, this is a good thing. This is a really good thing. Um, I just felt like he's going to sew that wineskin together of not having friendship with the world and intimacy in the secret place with, his, with the oil of his Holy Spirit. And so smile if you're like, yes, yes, I want that. Um, I'm going to read James chapter 4 real quick. Um, I only kind of have one pace, and it's just intense all the time. <laughs> so, um, but we love the word of God, right? Okay. Um, okay. James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? 
Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Um, and so I actually saw this picture of the Lord as, as you're turning just away from the world. That's all repentance is, is you just turn away from friendship with it. It's really easy and simple. It doesn't have to be this big dramatic thing. You just turn, you just turn away. And I saw as you were coming into the secret place, he was taking an oil, the oil of his Holy Spirit, and he was smashing it over your head. And it's actually the, the spirit of anointing that teaches you all things. That's 1 John chapter 2, um, verse 27. He's saying, His anointing teaches you about everything. It is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you abide in Him. And so I feel like in the secret place, He's going to teach you about Himself. The Holy Spirit is going to come and anoint you, and He's going to teach you all things. He's going to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And I even see some of the young people, it's almost like you're in here during church and it's like you, you, you're hungry and you want it, but there's like a, there's like a block. You're, you're like here, it's almost like you're watching more than you're participating. And I saw you guys just getting up and going into like little corners of the room and just seeking the Lord. Just close your eyes. <laughs> Forget about all the people around you for a minute during worship. And I just saw you seeking him, repenting from the world, and him smashing the oil of his Holy Spirit over your head and teaching you all things in the knowledge of him. You guys are forerunners for this generation and for this next building that's coming, for all the Gen Z and Gen Alpha. And he's setting you guys apart. He's setting you apart. You're going to look so different than the rest of the world, and that's okay. You're going to be filled with God and anointed with his spirit, and you're going to know him deeply in the, in the secret place. And so Kate's going to pray for us, and she also is probably going to share something. But I bless you guys. <laughs> Actually, if you raise your hand for being under 25, will you come down front? I saw some anointing oil in see. Will you just start praying over them? Okay. Can you guys just come on down here? Just stand up in a line and... Let's taste and see that the Lord is good. And let's believe. Let's reach out our faith. When we don't have faith, he gives us his faith. And I'm just going to pray. I'm so glad to be here today. One of my favorite things is kingdom currency. It comes in so many different forms. It comes in faith. It comes in love. It comes in relationships. We see it in this world, the things that are abundant and generous God has given us out of his heart because it's just who he is. He's not trying to be abundant and generous with us. It literally overflows from him. There's a Hebrew word for it, for his desire for you. And God's desire, it's called teshuva. And it's like the clouds in the sky they desire, the Bible says that the clouds in the sky desire to pour their rain out on the land. And the clouds don't need the land. <laughs> the land actually needs the rain, but it's the desire of the clouds. They're just like fat and happy up there with moisture. And they desire to pour out over the land. And I believe that of this community. I've been privileged to be able to come up here for the last three years from Cincinnati. There are, there's almost not a day that goes by that I don't think of you guys and pray for you and smile knowing that you're just a little bit further north and you are literally like advancing the gospel in Ohio. That the seed of Christ is going forth out of this house and out of this family. And I've heard the prophetic story of how Greg camped out in that land and started consecrating it before the deed was transferred. <laughs> and I've seen this beautiful space and had encounters with God here with 
so many of you, and I'm so excited that he has physically expanded your tent because I believe he is going to spiritually expand your tent. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells the parable of the sower, and Jesus is both the sower and the seed. He sows himself into the ground of our hearts. And that's, that's what you're carrying inside of you. When we're little kids and we say, like, I accept Jesus in my heart, it's the seed of Christ that is planted in you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it grows. So I'd love for you guys just to put your hands on your hearts as I pray. Father, I bless the family of Upper Room Tip City. From the oldest to the youngest, Lord, and everyone in between. I bless the seed of Christ that you have planted in their hearts and your design, which does not fail. And we bless the ones who aren't in this house today but have gone forth and return at different times. We bless the ones who will come. And I command a blessing, God, according to Deuteronomy 28, and I just say, grow, 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 grow. Enjoy the Lord. Enjoy the freedom that he has brought and brings and will bring because he's true and faithful. The songs we sang today, he has no equal. He has no rival. There is not a spiritual attack that can come against this house that the blood of Jesus cannot prevail over. And I just declare that in faith. And I bless your roots to go deep and your branches to go wide for the fruit to come in the way that it does. It's the Holy Spirit's fruit. It just comes because you're full of him. He is the indwelling Holy Spirit. The resurrected Jesus Christ is the indwelling Holy Spirit who lives and is thriving inside of you. And I just say, release him and enjoy him as you grow in him. next generation. Um, can, can you all stand? We're going to ask our prayer team to come and maybe off to the sides here. If you need prayer for anything, if you need healing, deliverance, uh, salvation, anything you may need, we're going to invite the team now to come and if you need them. But uh, man, we'll just pray. I love to pray for Braveheart as we dismiss here. If you can just stretch your hands out to them as they're praying. Um, from Cincinnati area as well as Dallas and where they're going to the ends of the earth. Uh, God, we just bless Braveheart. We, we bless their gospel message. We thank you for their heart for worship, their heart uh, for communion, their heart for the table, their heart for the gospel, the heart uh, for the ministry of reconciliation to bring people closer to you, Jesus. We thank you. We bless the entire team as they travel the world to bring your goodness, your gospel, your good news and you right there with people and churches. And we thank you for the resources. We thank you for, for them being a blessing here today. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. May you be blessed in your coming and your going. Love you. Mexico meeting. If you're interested in going to Mexico, um, or 
actually going to gather outside this middle door here on the north side of the sanctuary. We're going to gather through the north side. You can get your kids, and I'll be there in what will be the new big kids room. Also, the building is open next door. The doors, um, you can either go through this door right here in the middle that we're going to open, or you can walk around to the front and just feel free. Um, children cannot be unattended. There are, there are, there's a balcony over there. It does not have any protection on it. Uh, but you feel free. Go, go look at what you've sewn into. Bless you guys.